Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Marla, for the kind introduction. And um, thank you to all for taking a Saturday to learn about IBD with us. I think you'll find it fun, exciting, and informative, as we have found it to be in putting it all together. And a shout out to the whole iMedics team for pulling together another fantastic um, meeting, although I think you guys need to take up painting and sheetrocking in your future uh, as a toolkit, and that way you'll have the meeting all together wherever we go. All right, so I've been charged to talk about the role of diagnostic and therapeutic biomarkers in pediatric inflammatory bowel disease. And, and we'll cover adult IBD too, because adults for some people are important as well. So we'll, we'll talk about the, through the ages. Um, so my disclosures, um, I think anytime you talk about something, getting definitions out of the way first is important. It's good to know what the hell you're talking about before you start talking. So this is taken from the FDA website as guidance for pharma, um, and it's based upon an NIH consensus in uh, 2001 defining biomarkers as measurable substances that occur in nature that reflect physiologic, pharmacologic, or disease processes. And if we apply that to inflammatory bowel disease, where that probably um, intercepts the care of our patients most is at the time of diagnosis, and we'll look at each one of these in, to follow. Um, biomarkers may be able to predict eventual benefit from a treatment, and so this can be very helpful in our, our ever-evolving pursuit of personalized medicine in phenotyping our patients more carefully. Hopefully one of the important emerging themes that you'll get from today is this idea that we're taking care of two diseases, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, is very old thinking. Um, those who who don't study history or destined to repeat it. So the, even the name Crohn disease is, is an inaccurate name, right? First of all, no one spells it right. And if we look back at the original paper in 1932, in those days, authorship was in alphabetical order. So the disease was really discovered by a surgeon by the name of Ginsburg, who sometimes called in a urologist to help him in, in operate on these patients um, by the name of Oppenheimer. And so because the TI sometimes was by the ureter, Oppie and, and Ginsburg would operate. And what did you do? If it looked sick, you took it out. Well, then the patient would come back five years later, you'd take that out and that and that. And the next thing you knew, you had short gut patients. So they realized recurrent resection wasn't a way to take care of a patient. There was a doctor down the hall, Bureau Crohn, who was playing with this new substance called prednisone. And they said, Bureau, what if we gave these patients prednisone? What do you think? He goes, well, it couldn't hurt. It makes everything better. So they gave them prednisone, and they got better, and they published the paper in 1932. In those days, authorship was in alphabetical order. So C came before G. So the disease became known as Crohn's disease. Actually, it was initially called terminal ileitis. So they would tell the patient, you've been diagnosed with terminal ileitis. And after they got done um, calling the undertaker, they realized that that was a bad name. Um, so they got called Crohn's. And we need now, we're not even 100 years into the era, we need better nomenclature. We need better phenotyping. We need a better... Um, uh, break out of our patients than this one big umbrella and hopefully biomarkers are the way to do that. We could also use these to monitor both the safety of the drug and the therapy but also the disease and how deep is your remission and how good are we doing. One of the things that helped me in preparing this talk, because I've always been confused, the difference between surrogate and biomarker, so I think I finally nailed it in getting this talk together for you, so let me define surrogates for you. So all surrogates are biomarkers, but not all biomarkers are surrogates, okay? So a surrogate is a biomarker that's been proven to reflect a clinical endpoint. So I could use the surrogate to know that I got to my endpoint. Um, and, and that therefore becomes the difference between surrogates and biomarkers. And we can expect them to predict clinical effect or harm in, in a patient undergoing a particular treatment. So let's talk about these different ideas of where biomarkers may be most helpful to us. Um, in the idea of, of diagnosis, at the end of the day, you know, I'm always interested in patients say, well, what are, the, what are the symptoms of IBD? How do I if I have IBD? At the end of the day, there are only five GI symptoms, right? Belly pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, that's it. Let's get it out of the way right here up front. The one that's most commonly misspelt is vomiting, so let me fix that for you. Mild vomiting, one T, severe two T's, so now you know how to, how to spell it. Um, although now with Epic and spell check, we don't have to worry about that anymore. We know that from Jeff Himes and his son, um, when he was a struggling student applying to medical school, did a study almost two decades ago looking at the prevalence of um, recurrent abdominal pain in children. We know that 25% of school-aged kids have recurrent abdominal pain. 
One out of four is a high number. How do we know who to do more testing in? And how do we figure out who has inflammatory bowel disease and other disorders? And once we do figure it out, this idea of phenotyping, I explain this to my patients best in using diabetes. Diabetes, my blood sugar is high. You may not know all the ins and outs, but you recognize there are at least two types, type one, type two, but by diagnosing you that way, we get down to the, the pathophysiology, why is my blood sugar high, and therefore I change my treatment based upon that type of the disease. And that's where we need to go in inflammatory bowel disease. We'll probably be equally creative and call it IBD type one, type two, type three, type four, but we'll be able to better know which therapy is best for you, personalized medicine. What about using biomarkers as disease monitoring? So we, we need, you know, I took you through a little bit of history of how we ended up with the name Crohn's disease. Let's go through the history of the word flare. It's a word that I really wish would disappear from the lexicon of inflammatory bowel disease. And it goes back to that original um, um, history, right? So recurrent resection was a bad idea. Well, chronic steroids seemed even worse. How is IBD treated? Well, you came in dying of your symptoms. The doctor gave you prednisone. You got better. Then you came back complaining of the side effects of prednisone, so you got weaned off. And when you flare, come back and see me. I'll put you back on prednisone. So this idea where you read, everything you read about inflammatory bowel disease is a disease of recurrent flare remission, flare remission, flare remission. Well, of course, that's how we took care of the disease. But now, in 2018, we can induce and maintain a durable remission, why are we still talking about flares? Why would you live on the edge of a cliff and at any moment you could fall off? You don't live on the edge of the cliff, you live inland. And that's what we want. We want to move our patients from the edge of the cliff where they could flare at any moment and move them inland where they are in, uh, in a durable remission. And do we have a way of monitoring that remission to know when they may be falling out of remission or not? That would be wonderful to be able to have a non-invasive marker for that. So Jim Lewis, a deep thinker, um, gave a, a very nice review of biomarkers a few years ago. Um, the, the blue is decision points or, or time points in the journey of a patient with IBD. Uh, it shows, I think, more gold um, or whatever that color is. The other color, not the blue, are, are, are places where biomarkers could be very helpful which I just took you through. So I have symptoms, I need a marker to tell me should I do more testing, how likely is you'll have IBD. Then I could phenotype it and we're gonna get, this box is gonna grow much bigger than just two terms. And then I can get you into therapy. I can look to see if you're in true remission or not and, and prognosticate which therapy would be best for you. I can use some markers to adjust my therapy and that would be therapeutic drug monitoring. You're gonna hear great talks about that later so I will not talk about TDM in this talk. And then I can watch how likely you are to stay in remission and if you have GI symptoms are they because you ate too many beans last night for dinner or is it because your disease is falling out of remission and is this a true um, IBD related symptoms that you're having. So Bruce Sands a couple years ago gave a nice uh, review article as well on biomarkers and this was the list at the time um, that he did his paper. I could tell you this list has grown much larger but I'm just going to focus on the two that have been most studied um, and those are fecal markers specifically calprotectin and blood markers in the form of C-reactive protein. So let's go to the poop. Um, since that's the final common pathway of our, of our field. Um, so two main uh, fecal markers that have been studied are calprotectin and lactoferrin, and clearly more research has gone into calprotectin, and that's what my talk will focus on. These are proteins that are elaborated in the fecal stream when polys are degradated, so they're very um, nice markers of inflammatory activity in the GI tract. Recognize that that's exactly what they are. They are markers of inflammatory activity. So if my bowel is inflamed from salmonella or my bowel is inflamed from ulcerative colitis, the calprotectin or lactoferrin will still be elevated. So it just tells me that there's a PID, there's pus in there, but it doesn't tell me why. There are other states that will elevate these markers as well, especially inflammatory polyps, which we see more in the pediatric population probably than the adult, but cancer and, and, and other conditions will elevate these as well. So they're good markers to tell me that there's something going on, but not necessarily what. Um, in the right setting, um, this is a meta-analysis that looked at calprotectin, and we've come to recognize exquisitely sensitive and somewhat specific. The specificity really depends upon your pre 
test probability as it always does in any lab test. And most of the research that's been done has been looking at can I differentiate functional GI disorders from inflammatory bowel disease? Do I really need to go to invasive, expensive um, testing or can I use this uh, to differentiate the patient with inflammatory versus non-inflammatory symptoms? One thing that's very interesting, if you look at these studies, is that adults are much more likely to scoop the poop of their child than they are to scoop their own poop. Isn't that fascinating? That assumes that pediatric uh, calprotectin is scooped by the parent and not the child themselves. Maybe that's a wrong assumption, but, but, but uh, adherence in the pediatric population is, is better than the adults. Um, people are more willing to give their blood than their stool, but that may be cultural as well. European studies, they seem to be a little more free about sharing what comes out the other end. The sensitivity and specificity seems to be higher in adults than kids, but again, that probably reflects who these tests are being sent on, and in pediatrics, we tend to use them very liberally to try to differentiate between scope or not scoping our patient with recurrent symptoms. The other important point about these tests is what is the best cutoff value? So do I say anyone above 50 on a calprotectin gets a colonoscopy, anyone above 100, anyone above 300? Where I put that point will definitely affect the pre and post test probability. So if you look at, at the positive predictive value in adults, um, you need a pre-test probability of around 30, whereas to get to the same kind of uh, positive predictive value in children, you need to almost double that pre-test prob prob probability based upon the current uh, literature. This was a, a single center study done, I believe, in Australia. Um, they looked at almost uh, 5,000 calprotectins, which were submitted by the general practitioners. Ultimately, about a third of these children made it to the gastroenterologist, um, and roughly half of them underwent an, uh, further evaluation by the endoscopist. Uh, there were various fallouts uh, depending upon when the stool test was done and colonoscopy was performed, but ultimately they had very similar numbers, about 90 uh, patients with functional GI disorders and those with inflammatory bowel disease. And this was one of the earliest studies that showed us how uh, useful calprotectin was in predicting the presence of inflammatory bowel disease in children with recurrent um, GI symptoms, and there have been similar studies in the adult population as well. One biomarker that I'm only going to touch upon, but I think it gets forgotten too often, especially in pediatrics, is albumin. The, the upper line is if you, com if you combine a calprotectin result with an albumin and how well that um, predicts inflammatory bowel disease. So a patient with a elevated blood marker such as C-reactive protein, a microcytic anemia and hypoalbuminemia may be that exact patient to get a calprotectin on to see are we really dealing with bowel uh, inflammation and if so, go on to the next um, level of testing. What's also interesting probably to the folks in the adult audience is the kinds of numbers we see in pediatrics. So the mean uh, calprotectin in this population when they did have IBD was almost 1,300. I think you see much lower levels in, in adults. And that probably has to do with both location of the disease and the more inflammatory nature of pediatric IBD versus a, adult uh, presenting IBD. Um, so if we look in this study, again, the cut point, if you say anyone above 50, um, I need to think about inflammatory bowel disease. The, the sensitivity of that is just crazy. It's a very sensitive test, and it's even fairly specific. Obviously, as you take your cut point higher, you get much more specificity, but you lose the sensitivity. So it depends what you're trying to do, and, and usually we're trying to use this as a way in the diagnostic arena of deciding who needs invasive testing. We've also learned, though, in disease monitoring, this can be very helpful in seeing whether or not patients have actually responded to your therapy or not. Um, and so a fecal calprotecting uh, in this uh, ulcerative colitis study was very predictive of finding inflammatory disease um, while on therapy. Um, and this hot off the press, I think, was published, um, I think it's in, in print now, published online couple months ago in clinical gastro is the Image Kids study. So Ann Griffiths and Dan Turner, uh, an international multi-site study, looking to validate two different scores for MRE in pediatrics, one looking at bowel damage score and another looking at uh, ongoing inflammatory um, disease and using MR to, to look for that. Along the way, they're comparing it to endoscopy and also looking at biomarkers, specifically calprotectin and C-reactive protein. And, and what we learned from this study, if you look, the, the, you can see, just take you through the different columns. So deep healing was defined in this study as both a normal MR, 
and normal colonoscopy, but you also could have mucosal healing, normal colonoscopy, but abnormal MR findings. You could have um, normal um, MR findings, but mucosal inflammation, so changes on colonoscopy, and then you can have total lack of response in a sense, where both your MR is abnormal and your colonoscopy is abnormal. And what you can see, the, the top line here is the means on each of those, and you can see the more inflammatory disease, the higher the CalPro, and you can see the, the excellent predictive value of calling a, a 100, which is what these authors recommended, as your cut point of looking whether or not you've truly controlled disease. Um, and to show that in a more uh, bar graph distribution, you could see the rising levels of calprotect. And here you have deep remission, normal MR colonoscopy. Here you have both test colonoscopy and MR abnormal. And you can see the, the progressive rise in the calprotectin. Um, and basically the takeaway from this study as far as calprotectin, if your patient has a calprotectin of less than 100, highly likely they've responded to your therapy very well. And you may not even need to do MR or um, colonoscopy in that setting. Obviously this needs to be validated and needs to be followed out. At this time, this report is on 151 patients. However, if your calprotectin is over 300, that's got to get you to think about it's time to, to re-image my patient or re-scope. Something is not right in that bowel. So I just put together a few um, ongoing questions I think still need to be addressed about the use of calprotectin. Are there age-related effects? Should be a do we look at a calprotectin the same in a three-year-old as we do in a 23-year-old? Um, is there a real difference upon disease location? In the image kids data, it suggests that it's not, but there they looked at uh, isolated colonic disease versus ileocolonic disease. You really may see difference in uh, isolated TI disease and mid-small bowel disease. And it seems that the calprotectin will rise the, the further distal your disease is. So rectal disease is going to give you a higher calprotectin when it's at, uh, active than let's say mid-small bowel disease. What is our best cut point? Based upon this Image Kids uh, study, we would say less than 100 is really a pretty tight. If we're looking for tight control of our patients, that's probably the number to be treating, uh, shooting for. But is the cut point the same along the journey of inflammatory bowel disease? Do I need the same level uh, to make my decisions about diagnostic screening as I do treatment response? And is it one year the same calprotectin cut point as a patient who's been treated for five years? All questions that need to be answered. It turns out that even my own calprotectin will vary based upon the time of day. So your first poop of the day may have a different calprotectin level than your last. Now for some of us that's the same poop. But for a patient with an with a active colitis, that certainly is not. And there have been studies showing differences within the day. Um, there's certainly day-to-day -day variation. And then there are other just clinically important points to keep in mind. Patients on non steroidal anti-inflammatories will have elevated calprotectins. Other con founders in using the test. What about blood markers? So the one I want to focus on is C-reactive protein. Just again, to delve into history a little bit because I love doing this to medical students and, re and residents. Why is it called C-reactive protein? So actually, for those who remember infectious disease, this is from pneumococcal uh, research. The pneumococcus had A protein, B protein, C protein. And this is a acute phase reactant. And when it was first discovered, it was thought to be a response to the C protein in pneumococcus. And that's why it got its name C-reactive protein. Um, it's both a sensitive, however, very nonspecific marker of inflammatory um, state, and it's also very has a very short half-life. So it's a great marker to look at the responsive therapy, and certainly our infectious disease colleagues do that a lot for osteomyelitis, other infections. They look for a quick response to know that their antibiotic uh, um, use is appropriate, and we use it in inflammatory bowel disease, especially in the acute severe colitics. Um, I'll show you that data in a second. It's produced in the liver under the influence of IL-6 and therefore tied directly to TNF, and that's why it really seems to be a great marker for anti-TNF response uh, and probably anti-TNF need. Um, it's been shown that a C-reactive protein of greater than 45, three days into IV cortical steroid use. Um, ben Cohen's going to teach us about its acute severe colitis later today. But this is highly predictive of needing to go on to rescue therapy or, um, or colectomy. And, and in general, in ulcerative colitis, a good rule in ulcerative colitis is if you have an elevated C-reactive protein, you've got a bad situation going on because C-reactive protein is much more... Um, likely to be elevated in Crohn's disease than it is in ulcerative colitis, and therefore it's a, a 
a, a surrogate, I'm sorry, a biomarker, uh, but it's not a therapeutic target. Especially in, in ulcerative colitis, it's just one marker, one piece of data that we can use for our patients. It was used uh, and has been used for a while in, in the anti-TNF literature. This is a, a now somewhat older study um, for a lot of us, looking at if I have a patient on combination therapy, is it safe to, to withdraw the immunomodulator? Well, lo and behold, if they actually were truly in remission, meaning their C-reactive protein was negative, they were more likely not to need the combination therapy. We're going to have a lot of talk about combo versus mono and TDM, and we can really start teasing that apart. But the main signal here is a well controlled patient does not need as much therapy as a poorly controlled patient and C-reactive protein can help you figure out which one your patient is. What about the uh, Image Kids uh, data also looked at C-reactive protein here in pediatrics in specific and again you can see the, the, the elevation of C-reactive protein as you have less and less control but you could also see the, the overlaps and it's not as um, a, a tight measure of the level of control. So the more elevated it is, the worse it is, and that's about the best we can say about C-reactive protein. So it's a piece of data, and again, as I said, a tool, not a target. Um, again, I just want to go back to albumin. If we go back to that original study I showed you about the calprotectin, this is the albumin data. And you can see the very high positive predictive value in diagnosing a child with IBD of hypoalbuminemia. And we've certainly come to recognize that to be a very important biomarker in our acute severe colitics. So sometimes the old markers, microcytic anemia, albumin, and, and um, C-reactive protein can be very helpful. Where is sedimentation rate? Why am I talking about sedimentation rate? I think in this era, um, ESR has really fallen out of favor for so many different reasons. For those of us who remember doing it as house staff, it was a bedside test that you tape to the wall, and if it's not run within four hours of the drawer, it starts to become unreliable. In this age where labs are centralized, you could draw, if you get back your lab report, from yesterday's drawer and it says said rate still pending, don't even look at the result. That's not gonna tell you anything and I've gotten too many of those reports to even bother with that test anymore. Remember also it is uh, artificially elevated in the presence of uh, anemia and so it may be more of a marker of your patient's anemia than it is of their inflammatory disease. So certainly C-reactive protein I think has replaced um, uh, sedimentation rate in this day and age. What about some of the newer stuff that's coming? This is not ready for prime time yet, but it's just some work from Phil Minor at Cincinnati Children's that has really caught my eye. Um, and just an, a, 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 to mention that there are other markers that are coming. So CD64 is a protein that's elaborated mostly on macrophage, macrophages and monocytes. But if I have an activated poly and a migrating poly, it'll be uh, expressed as well. And we know that um, uh, you're going to have migrating white blood cells into the lamina propria in the face of um, inflammation. And what um, this study was able to show, small numbers, about three dozen patients, but this looks like a, predict, a potentially predictive uh, biomarker because patients who had low levels of CD64 on infliximab at a year were still much more likely to remain in clinical remission than those who had elevated levels of, of CD64. And unfortunately, in that same study, C-reactive protein was not as predictive of that. So while a C-reactive protein may be very helpful to tell me if my patient is responding today, it does not tell me how close they are to living on that edge of the cliff, right? And maybe this tells me more about being in land. Certainly data that needs to be reproduced, but just to whet your appetite that we're going to have even more and more and better biomarkers as, as time goes on. So my time, speaking of time going on, has gone on. So let me summarize. Um, both C-reactive protein and calprotectin are probably our most studied biomarkers. Um, there's certainly others and there are more coming. For diagnosis, these can be very helpful in telling us who needs more invasive and costly testing. But keep in mind the, 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 your population that you're testing, the pretest pop probability, and where you want to put that cut point. Um, I, I kind of like the image kids data, and I think 100 is probably a very good number. 50 just feels a little bit too too low for me, at least in pediatrics. Um, it may these can be very helpful in disease monitoring, and perhaps the best use of calprotectin is using it over time. So correlating your findings on an MRE on a colonoscopy with a calprotectin in a particular patient, and then trending over time. Maybe not totally reacting to any one abnormal measure, but seeing if you have a chronically elevated calprotectin, maybe time to to um, look more into the patient. We do have reimbursement problems with these tests. Um, they're actually 
actually is a little battle between the AAP and some insurers right now to try to get these uh, approved, certainly in pediatrics, where we'd like to do less colonoscopy and more non-invasive testing, and I'm sure adult patients feel the same way. There are new biomarkers coming, so stay tuned. And really the hope and prayer is that these will be, help us personalize our therapy, be able to target therapy, phenotype our patients better, and have prognosis predicted. So thank you for your attention.